Puerto Rican music is everywhere. Tarea bien cute, bien cute, bien cute. It's the classic. Gets all the tias moving. From epic salsas to iconic ballads, our songs resonate across the diaspora and beyond. They just strike a chord in your heart and they make you want to just book the next flight home. From WNYC Studios and Futura Studios, it's La Brega, Brega. the Puerto Rican experience in eight songs. Listen in English and Spanish wherever you get podcasts. Welcome to another episode of the Brown and Black Podcast. My name is Jack Rico. And I'm Mike Sarkin. And every week we take a look at race and pop culture through a brown and black lens. This week, we bring you the third of a series of special sponsored episodes celebrating Black History Month, featuring in-depth reviews of films from Universal Pictures Home Entertainment Vault. The theme, Black films that have become cultural phenomenons. And we're going to dissect why that is. They're all available at home on digital and disc with deleted scenes and special features. And we're going to talk about those as well. Each film represents a different genre of film. Thank you to Universal Pictures for the paid support of this episode. In this episode, we will delve into the critically acclaimed film Queen and Slim, a powerful and thought-provoking commentary on the Black experience in America. Hey, is this y'all? We have to go. I'm not a criminal. Are y'all the new Black Panthers? We didn't have a choice. It was self-defense. It's an honor to meet y'all. We didn't the black money and Clyde. Don't worry, you're safe here. Please! Y'all really gave us something to believe in. I'm tired of playing it safe. I want to ride or die. As long as my lady remembers me fondly, that's all I need. Thank you for this journey, no matter how it ends. Well, Mike, um, I've been having a blast doing these critical analysis with you. First episode, Get Out, was truly an enlightening experience uh, to do that project. And then Girls Trip, which is so on the opposite spectrum of Get Out. And that was a lot of fun, too. But now we're going to be doing Queen and Slim. And, you know, much like we've done in the first two episodes, I think it's really important for us to establish sort of like what our immediate reaction was, our first impressions when we first saw the film and what that film left in us and why today, years later, about six years later or so, we're now talking about it as one of these cultural touchstone films. So do you remember watching Queen and Slim and what was your first impression of it? I remember very vividly watching Queen and Slim. And at that point, I had interviewed Lena Waite a couple of times. And she's very likable, but she's she's almost like a poet, you know, in mm. just in the way she, she does things. And I was really kind of following her career, seeing what she was mm. doing. And I also knew the director, Malene Matsukis, was known for doing like these phenomenal, you know, music videos for Beyonce and Lemonade. I knew she was a powerful director. I knew Lena Waite was a powerful writer. So I, I really had high expectations going in. My first mm. impression was that I had read that right. she, she quoted Nina Simone and that it's an artist's duty to reflect times. And, and she called it protest art. And within the first 10 minutes of the film, right, you got what this was about. As a black man, you literally could have your life in your hands when you get stopped by a police. And what are you going to do in that moment if it's you or them? And then if it is them, if you do defend yourself, you know, your life, as you know, it is over. I very much remember watching it, thinking just how plausible this story could be. And, you know, th this is, the, I think, the beautiful thing about this podcast, the Brown and Black podcast, is that because I am not a black man, but I am still a person of Wait, color. Hold on a second. You're not a black man. <laughs> I thought something was up with the audio. I was like, 
are you not? <laughs> are you are you hearing me? I could, I could resist. I could resist. I could resist. So but ahead. you know, I am a brown guy, and so w- within that, in a system that isn't designed for brown and black people, I saw this in a different light. Okay, so check this out. I came into the understanding and the enlightening, the awakening moment for me as an American citizen to understand the plight of black history was something that I was delayed on for a long time. And you know what? That's on me. I didn't want to know the plight of the black person. You know why? Because I didn't want to also have to, in a way, carry that burden as well to know it, to be aware of it, and then to change my life around it. I wanted to live in a fantasy, Mike. I wanted to watch sports. I wanted to watch movies and arts and culture and live in a fantasy. I didn't want to face the dark history that this country had had. But let me tell you something, much like the character of Slim, played by Daniel Kaluuya in this film. And we'll get into the characters and what they represent and the connections. But much like him, at some point he had to face the world because the world needed an opinion from him. The world needed him to speak up, to stand up. This man was enclosed to the world. And that's how I felt for a very long time. So when I first saw Queen and Slim, I wasn't looking at race. I was looking as, oh, this is like the most beautiful black film I think I've ever seen. It's just every shot just looks like a like a portrait that should be hung in a museum or something. And well, it wasn't I have- understanding the racial implications of it because to me it was normal. This is the stuff that you see on news all the time. They're just talking about something we all see in the news. So it's not that drastically different. This is another movie where someone's getting, a black man is getting shot. I don't know. I don't know if I want to know more about it. It's painful, man. And so this movie is a movie about love and about pain. And when I saw it, This second time around, post Floyd, Black Lives Matter, reading the history, understanding the plight of Black America and Latin America, the Afro Latino experience, which is all over this film as well because of Melina Matsukis. It's like a new film for me. There is so much to unpack in this film. I I was looking forward to this conversation for that reason. There's so many things to talk about, but I I do want to touch upon one thing you said, just how beautiful it was. And that's Ava Bukowski, who's the director of photography. And, you know, she really got her start or got her, made her name doing Insecure. And she's talked a lot about how going to film school, they they never talk about lighting non-white people. For her, besides so many other things that this film does, the idea of having two main characters who are not biracial looking, who are dark skinned black folks, not to mention the fact that the woman's taller than the man. So there's so many things that are uh, subversive about this film that are subtle in some ways. And that is the beauty of a film like this, where you can look at it just as a story, because at at the end of the day, what is it? It's a road movie. And that's a whole type of of film. To me, it's a road movie that travels the racial psyche of America. It's an ode to blackness, but it's also a, like most road movies, you know, road movies are about characters exploring the frontiers of their mental and their physical space. Usually they end up getting a greater understanding of whatever it is they're running from or finding out what they're really running from. And I think that there are so many layers to this film in throwaway dialogue even that the more aware you are of the intent and and the history behind some of the dialogue, the more powerful this film becomes. Now, one of the beautiful things about Queen and Slim is that those are the names of the characters. Lena Waithe didn't want to give them real names. So Jodie Turner Smith's the actress, her name is just Queen. Why is it Queen? Because that's how she sees all black women. 
And slim, slim is a term of affection. And it's every, you know, in the eyes of Lena, that's, that's every black brother. And so you got Queen and Slim. That alone, just beginning the second watch of that film, it, it really created a sense of a collective projection of a whole culture where it's not specific. It's, a, it's about you need to see yourself in these characters, no matter where you're from, because it's not specific. It's subject to your interpretation. And so right there and then, I saw myself in both characters immediately. I saw myself in the ambitious queen who was a lawyer and against the death penalty. And that's why she was in Cleveland. And then you have Slim who, and this was me before, who didn't want to know anything outside of his small inner circle surroundings. As he said in, in, in a part in the movie, within the movie, th there was a particular scene where he goes, I just want to go home. And I want to see my family. If you turn yourself in, you will never see them again. You could tell the simplicity of who he is. And you could tell the complexities of the coming of age of this woman who was starting to understand that the world just could not be healed. Don't you care about telling your family what's going on? And she said, to be frank, no. And he couldn't process that when he said that. How could a black woman feel that when he has already been like, the whole movie has been making a, a deal about him being so close to family you know, being a simple man whose legacy at that moment was just to be another family man and have his own family. And this woman doesn't want a fa doesn't even want to be connected to her own family. So we are seeing two extreme spectrums collide in an event where they're both not supposed to be in. I agree. And I think also one of the, the contrasts between those two characters <laughs> is that, you know, it's her that encouraged her, the lawyer, the level-headed one that says we should run. And it is her, I think, that has more to run from, or let's put it this way, mm. nothing, to, nothing to hold her back than he does. You know, she spends a lot of time alone. So for her, wherever she goes, as they say, there she is. So with him, he had these anchors. And I think that they represent two sides of, of black identity as well. You, you know, the, the neighborhood you grew up in, the situation you came from, the, the, the class you were born in. Do you, do you have to let that go and become something disconnected or do you stay and embrace what you have and, and make family more important than anything? And the dichotomy of those two choices, I think says a lot about what it is to be definitely a person of color, but definitely to be black in this country. And that was just a prologue, Mike. That was just like, the movie hasn't even introduced the titles. <laughs> What an opening, man. And so it hooks you right off the bat. We start understanding what this journey is about to be. And I think that what anybody is in for is this incredible journey through race, class, American history, police brutality, serious, heavy conversations that are done in the most artistic way with black skin in a way that I have never truly experienced before. Mike, in this segment, we're gonna be talking about the brown and black experience of watching Queen and Slim. And Watching this film and knowing the news of what happened with Tyree Nichols recently, how relevant is the, is the film for you? Because I'm already seeing this film from the perspective of a post Floyd era. Now we're watching it during in the middle right now of the Tyree Nichols assassination. How as a black man, how are you experiencing this film? Watching this film again, I, I will say probably of all the films that we've, we've watched for this month, 
This one I probably had the most emotion about. I mentioned in Get Out how that that scene where, you know, he's being followed by the car and just that that idea of, of fear that something horrible could happen. I, I see countless, countless, dude, countless videos on social media of police brutality, police beating up young black women in school, smashing their heads against the ground, police punching black women in their face, police killing black men left and right with their arms up. Okay. Just shooting at them. The question, they don't even ask questions later. You know, the, the old adage. So I'm filled with these images and it's disturbing. It's, it's normal. It's every day. It's increased. It's worse now than it was when this movie came up, in my opinion. So seeing this, I, I'm, I'm reminded that, that this film is essentially a, a modern day black parable. It, it's a parable about what's going on. Black Lives Matter created, like I was talking about, a moment of visibility. A movie like this is similar. It's very powerful. It's very powerful because just like it is scary to, to think somebody might be wanting to do me harm, it is a nightmare to have a, a deadly encounter with the police. And then in a situation like that, like we see in the movie where that's a nightmare, your life is over. That's it. There are no choices. There's no going back. You, there, you don't have any other choice. And I, I think part of the metaphor here is that they literally have to escape America. And that's part of the, the plight for black people too. How, how do you escape? You know, can you get out? And then coming to the Tyree Nichols, who turns them in? It's a black man. It's a black man who has been corrupted by the society. He's a victim of capitalism. This is how we're socialized. This is what racism does to the black community. And this is something that, that both Lena and, and Melina have spoken about. But for me, seeing this, I, I'm reminded just how powerful this is and how unfortunately this could have been made 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and it would play out the same. How did you see black masculinity here? Because the lead masculinity in this film is slim. It's Daniel Kaluuya. And I wanted to kind of understand if you saw yourself in him. Well, let's put it this way. I, I, of course, as a black man, I see myself in him, but I also am aware of how different he is than me. You know, I'm six foot two. He's a short man. She's taller than him. You know, being a short man is a very specific thing in society. As a man, you know this. You know, if you're a tall man, you know short men. And if you're a short man, you know what it is to be a short man. It's a very specific. You have to constantly, in, in many ways, like assert your masculinity. You know, mm -hmm. so I liked that he was someone who did not feel he had to assert his masculinity. It's a different type of black man. He was not gentle to the point of like being taken advantage of, but he was also not arrogant or pushy or chauvinistic. He was a thoughtful young man, you know, was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I enjoyed seeing this representation of black masculinity, of a black male character, because these are the kinds of people sometimes, someone who was minding their business, who was in the wrong place in the wrong time, who happened to be parked somewhere and they get killed or, or they mistaken for someone. And, and I, I liked the everyman quality that he had, how he was dressed, everything. One thing that I did want to sort of deconstruct here for a second and sort of focus on is that remember that this black masculinity that's being shown in Queen and Slim is not created by a man, by a no. black man. It's created no. by a woman who is also a lesbian, who's gay. So you have a gay black woman writing masculinity on film. How different is it when a woman of color, a black woman who's gay writing a, a man than a man writing a man. Well, I mean, I think it's not so much the character as the point of view uh, of the character. I think she created a character a very well balanced in my opinion, character. And if you say there are three major black male characters in the film, the uncle the guy who turns them in and, and slim, 
you know, there's a balance. I think it's great. I think it's a lesson in you know, understanding what it is to be human. He, he, he's a man. He's not perfect, but he is not a fantasy of a man. I've seen movies. There's one out right now where female writer, female director, and the male character is just a straight up fantasy. Like that guy really doesn't exist, but I understand that's what they would like a guy to be like. I didn't feel that here. I felt that this was a real person. Jack, now we're going to get into the deeper conversation where we talk about the film, the portrayal of police brutality, the fact that it did not win any major awards, and, and essentially what the legacy of this film is. Let me ask you a question um, for you now. You said when you first saw the film that you, you know, there are a number of things about it that stood out to you. Just, you know, you didn't think about all the racial implications necessarily. But you, it was a you know beautiful story, well told. I'm curious your thoughts about the love and the love making and and how they're juxtaposed against the the protest and whatnot. And what was your reaction to that representation of, of black love and and what what did it say to you or and how did it strike you when you saw it? You know that's interesting because I'm not used to seeing that many black romantic dramas. And this film in particular, for me, wasn't a romantic drama, even though you could draw those, you know, those conclusions. It's a little bit of everything. But what you do notice is if there is an insight into what black love is, it's not just romance. It's the love of the community. It's the love that they find within their own people you know you were talking about the judas character it's not everybody you know most of everybody was helping them out and that was a form of love it was a love for yourself a love for a stranger a love you know when when uh, there was one character's kid that went to go get something and his father got hit by them in the truck uh, and then there was a struggle to find out if they should take him to the hospital or not. And that's when Slim said, we're going to take him to the hospital. It's a form of love. And I think we're not really used to seeing black love cinematically. We're not used to seeing black love on the big screen like that. And, you know, you had talked about the lack of awards. And this is something I think I, I wanted to ask you because I think there needs to be layers. How is it possible that Queen and Slim never got a Golden Globe, which is the joke award of Hollywood? Well, I and mean, they couldn't even get a Golden Globe for that. And there's been a lot of reports on that. But then for it not to get an Oscar award, Mike, for the writing, for the cinematography, for the direction, how 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 does this movie escape? anybody in 2017 18 i'll answer that i took I'll, I'll give you my opinion on that one i think golden globes i think this was the at least the year or two before the golden globes would be exposed for just how biased and racist they were and just how all you know essentially lily white they were so that shouldn't be a surprise but in terms of and this is the larger conversation about recognition in the industry and and the conversation because this is happening during Oscar season and we're seeing it played out again with The Woman King, where a film that is clearly a lot of work, a lot of time, you know, cinematography, a lot of power, you know, one of the greatest actresses of our time starring in it, doing, you know, physically demanding thing, all these things, and it gets no recognition. It gets no recognition from the industry, from the dominant culture that rules the industry and that recognition i mean this is a film you know we're giving it recognition i think the black community has given it recognition but in many ways it plays out like the characters in the film where the characters in the film black people get it they understand what 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 happened in that scene they understand what happened in that moment that's why they're helping him. they know he's not a killer they know that 
not only they knew more about the white cop than he did. They knew that that white cop had a history of killing black folks, of brutalizing black folks. So in the black community, you'd say he had it coming. Okay. But Mm. he didn't even know that, but they also knew from living where they live. And, And there's a reason both Melina and Lena have talked about why they set this film in Cleveland, because it was one of the stops along the underground railroad, you know, and they see this in, in some ways as a, as a, a, an inverse underground railroad. But, but in many ways, I think that metaphor right there of the, how the black community acknowledges that, but in the media, the general, the mainstream, no, they're, they're these cop killers. They're on the run that are, uh, they don't even talk about in the news what the history of this cop had been or what was going on. So I think that the fact that this film got no awards speaks to, this is a film that you have to care. You have to care what the film has to say. You have to actually watch the film. If you get that screener that year, you actually have to watch it. And you see a film. It's a demanding film, Mike. Well, it's a demanding even... film. And here's the question. Here's the question. It's demanding right? if you actually sit and watch it. It's not the, if you just look at that art and it's two black people, but you don't, and you don't care. But okay. You're or European. You don't give two hoots about America. You actually hate America. And now here's the plight of America, right? Slavery. And they're like, I'm sick, and he- I'm sick of hearing about it. Every movie I see, there's always something going on. I don't want to see this anymore. You know what? Let's send the intern to go see it. What does a creator do in that moment, Mike, when the system of criticism is distorted? The Creator system don't. of criticism, to me, to be quite honest, it doesn't work. If you're going to have a dominant group constantly saying, we don't want to watch black films, then how are we ever going to do that? If they're not, if they're, there's going to be no parody in black, you know, creators at the Academy. It's never going to happen. So how well, are creators, black creators going to get their movies recognized? Well, again, it, it recognized and recognized by how are they going to get their films made? That that's more the issue. They should get their make films made by any means necessary. And and the recognition, you don't make films like this to get that recognition. Jordan Peele did not make Get Out to get the recognition from the Academy. He made it because this was in him. He wanted this is something he wanted to make for years. Get Out cost like four million dollars, made over three hundred million dollars. So the answer, in my opinion, is that you ignore that judgment system. You have to, you have to ignore the judgment system and make the films that you want to make and, and yes, do Mike, everything but you can. Art without audience. marketing is, 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 is invisible. These award shows, the only reason they exist is to market movies. We've Agreed. seen the metrics go up every time a movie is recognized or actually wins something, or there's a, actor or actress that was nominated we see the numbers go up artists depend on that marketing so i understand what you're saying art is art and you shouldn't fuck with art i get it Mm -hmm. but this is what makes them make a living off of it if you deny them that mike how are they going to make another black movie i believe that you can continue to make black films now is it more difficult? Can you have a string of bombs and be a white filmmaker and then make a string of bombs and still get another deal? Yes. Okay. As a black filmmaker, you, you may have to try hard if your film doesn't make money. I mean, this film did make money, it didn't make the kind of money or get the kind of recognition that it should have. But we also have to look at the politics, the politics of art. You know, Hitchcock never won an Oscar because there's a politic to it. So the politic, in my opinion, is always going to be there. You can't let that dissuade you. You can't. Because if you do, then you're a slave to it. We could debate the the validity of a competition anyway and the relevance of the Oscars anyway. We could debate that. But the question really becomes like, who are you making this film for? And can you reach the people you want to reach? And that's really the challenge. So I, I say that that the challenge still exists. I mean, there was a thinking for a long, long time in the industry that black stories don't travel. Basically, like you're saying, Europeans, ah, they don't care. Okay. Black Panther changed all that. Get out, changed all that. So there are films now that are changing that narrative and that paradigm. And you just have to keep pushing. You have to keep making great films because eventually, you know, 
will break through. Of course. To me, this is a crime. You had one of the great black modern writers, one of the great black, few black female directors. That was her first feature film. And you had an Oscar-winning actor in the making in Daniel Kaluuya. You had the cream of black excellence in that film. And for it not to be recognized, that's the crime. Mike, in this fourth segment, we're going to be having the movie conversation. And in this movie conversation, we're going to be discussing the Black Bonnie and Clyde comparisons, Lena Waite's transformation from a TV writer to a pop culture figure, the cinematography, the aesthetic of the film, the social commentary about the film, the rewatchability factor. But let's begin with one of the things that I most associated this film with. Which is as soon as I saw it, yes, it's a road trip. But as you remember, the storyline is eerily familiar to Bonnie and Clyde. And I think there was even a moment in the film that one of the characters called them the Black Bonnie and Clyde. So for you, is this as simplified as, yep, Queen and Slim is the Black Bonnie and Clyde film? Or do you think that there's a better comparison or a, a better expression? to define that film? Well, I think the comparisons to Bonnie and Clyde are always, you know, the idea of a romantic couple on the run for the law is always going to bring up a Bonnie and Clyde comparison. But I think this is probably a little more like Selma and Louise, especially all the way up to the end. I think that this is a film that, like I said, it's about these characters who are running from something and they're running from something, but, but they're not committing crimes along the way. Right. They're not, they're they're not, criminal fugitives they're, they're but not, they are fugitives well, they, of a the, system they're fugitives of a system and they committed a crime but the crime has been committed against them has been committed against us the crime is ongoing and that's that's part of the mm. the you know the the antagonist in this film is the society is the justice system we know that if they catch them there's no way they can get free we know that is a very good chance not only that, if they live, they will be in jail for the rest of their lives, you know, or get the death penalty. So right. the stakes are very, very, very high. So that comparison, you know, Bonnie and Clyde, you know that they're not going to get off, <laughs> you know, but I right. think it's probably a little more like Thumb and Louise meets Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Okay, because you just mentioned three white films, Mike. That's right. And I want to know if there's any black film comparisons. In terms of a genre, I mean, this does a number of things. There's romance, there's some comedy in it, but this really follows a formula of a road movie. And most road movies have been white, whether it's true romance or any number of films about a couple on the run. This is groundbreaking in the idea that it's a black couple on the run. We've never really mm-hmm. seen that. So I, I would say there isn't. a a black film this can be compared to. I think that's part of what makes it so iconic because not only is it a black couple, but they're unlike any black couple you've ever seen on screen before. You know, you really shouldn't text and drive. Ain't nobody texting. I'm making sure I don't get lost. I could tell you how to get to my house. Give me my phone. Relax. I'm going to give it back. Is he going to tell me where to turn? Yeah, just... Oh, so now you're going to point the direction. I'm telling you where to go. You made a playlist? That's cute. Don't go to my phone. Did you like In a Sentimental Mood before or after Love Jones? I knew about it way before Love Jones. Mm-hmm. Don't lie. You know, okay, with the more I got, I saw the move. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. Mike, you talked at the beginning of the episode that you had been following the career of Lena Waithe. And I think just in the opening scene, you can tell the gift that Lena Waif has in the dialogue of that. It felt very Quentin Tarantino, the way that Quentin opened up Pulp Fiction. They're at a restaurant, they're having a dialogue, but much like Quentin, 
you know, Melina Matsukis and, and, and Lena Waithe decided to kind of maybe even do their own version of it, where it's the first date. They're starting to get to know each other. But this is where Lena Waithe comes in and just flexes, dude. The writing between the two is like a tennis match of the two greatest tennis players. And that's how it felt. It was just like there was almost a competitive spirit in the dialogue where at the end she's like, do you really like this place or is it the only spot you could afford? And Slim says, it's black owned. And she just leans back speechless. And there's only one thing that she can say. Touche. When you have a film where the character feels like they just got beat in a debate <laughs> and you feel the same exact way, that's the writing plus the acting plus the cinematography that just lets you know the type of excellence that you're watching. I, I agree with you a thousand percent. It's, it's the writing, but it's also knowing how to construct the scene because the scene, as we've talked about here, conflict, you know, you always have to have conflict and a conflict in, in a movie, in a script is a conflict of values. So their dialogue is telling us who they are. It's not just the right. dialogue. So we're understanding who they are and her values. She's hoisting upon him. He's defending himself, showing his values. And so that's the conflict, but it, it it's like you said, it's like sparring. So mm -hmm. I also felt it's like a joust. It's like a joust, but it's also very real. Many black men will talk about how black women will give them a hard time, you know, and this is something that goes on. But what I enjoyed about it is that it's playful. If she's a little hard on him, a little harsh, a little judgmental. Okay. And he's like, well, why you judge me? But then later on in the film, there, there are scenes where he says something to her. He says, you know, oh, you're crazy. And she's like, you know, it should be against a law to call black woman crazy. <laughs> Now that, that one line speaks volumes. It speaks volumes about what it is to be a black woman. It speaks volumes about Lena Waite and, and her understanding of what it is to be a black woman. She also understands though, that this, this narrative of the angry black woman and, and how if a black woman is angry, she's pretty damn justified because there's plenty of shit that she's gone through in her own life and in the, in just the life of this country. So I say all that to say, yes. The, the dialogue is terrific. And I think that that's something you hone also when, when you do TV, you, you learn to be very good at dialogue. All the characters seem very real. I've met these characters. How long you need to stay? A night or two. Well, which one is it? Two nights. Uh, we need some cash. How much? Enough to last us for a few days. What else? We need one of your cars. Do you kiss my black ass? He let him cost more than he love us. I ain't got no extra cars just laying around. I want to talk about the aesthetics of this film, and this is the reason I want to talk about Melina Matsukas. You've also been following for quite some time. I got to tell you, man, I when I saw Queen and Slim, I don't focus too much on the writers or the directors when I'm watching a movie. I just watch the movie, and I let the movie speak for itself. I'm not focused on the gossip of how it happened i just want to focus on the film so i didn't really know the profile of melina matsukas dude when researching this i'm like i think i want to be melina matsukas <laughs> after reading so much about her first of all and this is the part that i think we need to sort of lay overlay on top of this film in this conversation, which is the Afro-Latino experience here. Melina Matsukas is Afro-Latina. Her mom is Cuban. Her father is Jewish, Polish, Greek. And they grew up, she grew up, I, she, I think she was born in 1981, grew up in Co-op City in the Bronx. Okay, if anybody knows anything about Co-op City, that is one of the poorest areas in America. She ended up going to NYU. She ended up going to then LA to the American Film Institute, I think, and got like a master's in cinematography. Just had done four videos before Beyonce calls her and says, I want you to do four videos for me. 
Then she went ahead and became like a music video director icon. Everybody wanted a piece of her. Rihanna, Jennifer Lopez, and more, the biggest names. And she comes out and says, listen, I'm going to do my first debut film. And if you know anything about me, you know that I'm going to use fashion, photography, race, literature, class, society, politics. I'm going to throw it all in and I'm going to give it this glamour aesthetic. Now, Mike, here's what makes that brilliant. And this is what makes her, to me, she's going to win an Oscar. Mark my words, Mike. Melina Matsukis will win an Oscar by the end of the decade. She is that good. She has created this ideal of beauty and love in a world that hates blacks. And because the world hates blacks, and because Hollywood has stripped the dignity and humanity of blacks in films for so long, I think Melina wanted to then do the complete opposite. Let's make them beautiful within this pain. Dude, the clothes, the actors, the sets, the design, the cinematography, the camera selections, how scenes could look like their portraits hanging in a museum, everything about this, the selection of music, the writing, everything. Dude, it's just like everything about this movie was so seductive, sexy, even within all this violence and brutality, Mike. And I just said to myself, wow, I can't believe I'm loving the aesthetic of this film while feeling this pain that these characters are going through. And I think that that's the magic that Melina Matukas brings to, to any project that she's involved in. Well, I agree. And I think one of the things about music video directors and, and directors who are from commercials is you have to learn the economy of storytelling. You have to tell as much as you can within the frame. And I think that that's something that she's clearly gifted at doing. There's a lot going on in these frames. There's a lot of symbolism. There are a lot of elements that support the underlying themes of the film, just in the locations, how things are shot, where the camera's placed. So this is someone who really understands the language of film. And I agree with you. I think she will definitely win an Oscar. I, I look forward to see whatever, whatever she and or Lena does next. Unfortunately, I think that this film had more resonance for me seeing it now like I said at the beginning, then when I saw it, because of so many recent memories of things that, that the police have done, that, that have happened, how many innocent black lives have been taken, how commonplace it is. I think when this movie came out, Trump had just been in office for a while and, and we knew what was going on. There was a, the feeling of like a backlash from the Obama years. There was this feeling like, oh, we're going to double down. Things are going to get worse for black folks. And so this Film, like I said, is, is a parable, but I also feel like it, it is a film, like you asked, that 30 years ago, this film would have had power. 30 years from now, this film will have power because unfortunately, I do not think that this problem is going to go away. I do not think that the justice system is going to right itself and all of a sudden, yeah, you know, you get a fair trial if you're black. I don't think it's going to happen. I think this film speaks to so many aspects of black life. And, and, and in many ways, it celebrates how we're able to take this beautiful film about something very ugly. And, and, and that, that's what an artist can do, make you appreciate the beauty or, or find beauty in pain. That's what poetry can do. This film, in many ways, is poetic. It's an ode, like a poem is an ode to Black life. And I think that, that it will stand the test of time. I think it is what it is, and it's why we chose it. Hey, 
And for our final segment, Mike, we're going to analyze some of the bonus features uh, of this film. And I'm going to begin right off the bat in telling you that I did not see this movie in the traditional way in its rewatchability aspect. Um, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, Mike. I'm not sure if you did this, but I did this. I decided because I had already seen the movie uh, in theaters already, I decided to watch the bonus features first. And then watch the movie so I can compare the two viewing experiences. And so, wow. Can I tell you that I think that everyone moving forward, before they watch a movie a second time, they should watch all the bonus features first before they watch the movie. Why? And this was like the cool thing. I was looking for things now as opposed to accidentally maybe not catching it, now I was looking for it. So I was definitely looking at it from a critic's point of view that allowed me to understand every aspect of the creator's mind on the location, that way that scene was constructed and why the intentionality behind every scene and to get to know these creators in Lena and Melina just gave that movie, dude, gold status, in my opinion. Dude, like I watched those behind the scenes and I was like, I want them on the show. <laughs> so I, I, I feel like, you know, it's what the best, the hands down, the best behind the scenes to me was whoever had the brilliant, brilliant idea of having Lena just sit down at a table in a darkened room and read from her script. I was like, amazing. wow, that, that's what brings back what you were saying about how could this not have gotten nominated? They never read that script. That's right. They never read that script because I went back. Seeing the movie, the movie is a specific experience. And I think Melina did a beautiful job. But that script, it's a whole experience in itself. And, and I would say it's, it's, it's such a beautifully heartfelt script. And then you have the footage of her reading it while you're seeing the footage, right? Reading it while you're seeing the footage. But then you see how the beauty of a collaboration where she wrote that a cop kills this woman, uh, kills a uh, queen. But then the director made sure that that cop was a white woman. That speaks to, to how white women are complicit, you know, and, and, and white feminism, you know, and, and, so there, there's so many levels to, to, to this movie that when you see the behind the scenes, you really understand uh, what it is to be a black woman in this industry and, and how important it was for them to say so many things. Like you said, the intentionality of so many scenes, every single frame of that movie was intentional and it come and it shows. And when you watch it again, you realize, yeah, this was a, a, this was a masterpiece. We just didn't quite know it time well that concludes our analysis about the film queen and slim a film that highlights the impact of systemic racism and prejudice as well as the power of love and healing we hope you enjoyed our analysis of the film and its themes as well as our deeper conversation about representation and diversity in hollywood on screen and behind the camera we covered a lot of ground today mike from the black experience watching queen and slim to the deeper conversations about the metaphors and even delved into the bonus features and special features of the blu-ray and dvd release queen and slim is truly a cultural touchstone it's a film that has the ability to start important conversations about race racism and i'm certain and i know you are jack as well that it will continue to resonate with audiences of all backgrounds for many decades to come and just for our brown and black listeners you can now buy this movie for seven dollars and fifty cents from now until february 28th at get out queen and slim straight out of compton do the right thing and girls trip to your movie collection just go to voodoo.com and redeem the code celebrate black history for details check our episode show notes in the description and for those who want to stay updated on upcoming movies sign up for universal's email list to get sneak peeks at upcoming movies go to uphe.com slash news once again thank you to universal pictures for their paid support of this episode and that's it for this special episode of brown and black if you would like to support this podcast please subscribe and leave a review 
Your help will allow us to be heard by many more people. This episode was edited by Joshua Tirado. You can follow our comments and opinions on at Brown Black Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and now we're on YouTube. In the next episode, we'll be analyzing straight out of Compton. So be sure to tune in. We'll see you on the next episode of Brown and Black.